Good morning, friends. We are on chapter 20, the landmark study. By the 1990s, it would have alarmed Dr. Herschel Jick out in Boston to know that his letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, which he had long forgotten, had become a foundation for a revolution in U.S. medical practice. This was wildly beyond, beyond, beyond anything Herschel Jick intended when he penned it. But that's what happened. The revolution extended to hospitals, medical clinics, and family practices across the country. It's unclear who retrieved the Porter and Jick letter from obscurity, but it appears to have been cited first as a footnote in Kathy Foley and Russell Portney's 1986 paper, In Pain. In time, the paragraph became known simply as Porter and Jick. That shorthand, in turn, lent prestige to the tiny thing in the claim attributed to it that less than 1% of patients treated with narcotics developed addictions to them. That less than 1% statistic stuck, but a crucial point was lost. Jick's database consisted of hospitalized patients from years when opiates were strictly controlled in hospitals and given in tiny doses to those suffering the most acute pain, all overseen by doctors. These were not chronic pain patients going home with bottles of pain pills. It was a bizarre misinterpretation, for Jick's letter really supported a contrary claim that when used in hospitals for acute pain, and then when mightily controlled, opiates rarely produced addiction. Nevertheless, its message was transformed into that broad headline, Addiction Rare in Patients Treated with Narcotics. <laughs> Others began citing its purported claim. Marcia Stanton remembers citing Porter and Jick frequently in educational seminars that she gave through the 1990s to doctors and nurses on pain treatment. Everybody heard it everywhere. It was Porter and Jick. We all used it. We all thought it was gospel. A lot went into making it so. Porter and Jick appeared in that Bible of a scholarly and journal journalistic rectitude, the New England Journal of Medicine. Medical professionals assumed everyone else had read it, but only in 2010 did the NEJ, NEJM put all its archives online. Before that, the archives only went back to 1993. To actually look, look up Porter and Jick to discover that it was a one-paragraph letter to the editor and not a scientific study required going to a medical school library and digging up the actual issue the actual issue, which took time most doctors didn't have. Instead, primary care docs took the word of pain specialists, who pointed to Porter and Jick as evidence that opiates were far less addictive for chronic pain patients than previously thought. Not that primary care doctors needed much encouragement. Chronic pain patients, desperate for relief, could be insistent, rude, and abusive to staff, and took a long time to diagnose and treat. Physicians had a mantra. One chronic pain patient can ruin your whole day. Now a solution was at hand. That single paragraph, buried in the back pages of the New England Journal of Medicine, was mentioned, lectured on, and cited until it emerged, transformed into, in the words of one textbook, a landmark report that did much to counteract fears of addiction in pain patients treated with opiates. It did nothing of the kind. In 1989, monogra in a 1989 monograph for the National Institutes of Health, physicians from Harvard and Johns Hopkins urged readers to consider the work of Porter and Jick which showed clearly that fear of addiction in those with no past drug abuse didn't justify avoiding opiates since the study showed that addiction among patients given these drugs in a hospital setting was extremely low. One researcher writing in 1990 in Scientific American called Porter and Jick an extensive study. A paper for the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement called Porter and Jick a landmark report. Then the final anointing. Time magazine in a 2001 story titled Less Pain, More Gain called Porter and Jick a landmark study showing that the exaggerated fear that patients would become addicted to opiates was basically unwarranted. For years in medical schools, Marcia Staten recalled, I clearly remember instructor, instructors saying, don't overdose, don't overdose, don't overdose, don't make these patients addicted. But now here's the statistic. Look, oh, that's in print. It's gospel. I used Porter and Jick in lectures all the time. Everybody did. It didn't matter whether you were a physician, a pharmacist, a nurse, you used it. No one disputed it. Should we have? Of course we should have. Everyone knew of opiates' painkilling benefits, but how addictive were they? That was the question. Most doctors figured history and experience showed that the answer was very. Porter and Jick, as it was cited, cited suggested otherwise. So did Dr. Portnoy. Depending on the patient, he believed, these drugs might be used to great advantage. Portnoy was a pain management pioneer. In addition to his Beth Israel appointment, he was an editor-in-chief at the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, an editor, an editor at Pain, 
and on the editorial board of the other medical journals. He would write numerous books, textbooks that students used in medical school. He was quoted often in newspapers. Above all, Portnoy took his message on the road to the kinds of association conferences where new ideas in medicine are proposed. The International Association for the Study of Pain, the American Pain Society, the American Academy of Pain Medicine. All this was all of this helped create, by the mid-1990s, a new conventional wisdom that science had advanced and now knew that opiates wouldn't addict a pain patient. Addicts and pain patients were two different things. With addicts, their quality of life goes down as they use drugs. One leading pain doctor, Scott Fishman, told New York Magazine in 2000, with pain patients, it improves. They're entirely different phenomena. This spelled bad times for the more complicated, multidisciplinary approach to pain. Why, after all, was all that effort necessary if pain patients could be given pills with little risk of addiction? Patients, too, were hard to motivate when the treatment required behavior changes, such as more exercise. <laughs> pills were an easier solution. Multidisciplinary clinics began to fade. Over a thousand such clinics existed nationwide in 1998. Only 85 were around seven years later. Out in, out in Seattle, Dr. John Lozier and his staff soldiered on at the University of Washington Center for Pain Relief, expanding on the ideas of John Bonica. But as insurance companies stopped paying for pain services, the university's medical center eliminated them. In 1998, Lozier resigned in disgust. The university eventually moved the historic clinic to a basement. There it remained a game preserve of sorts for a few multidisciplinary holdouts who kept their heads down. A plastic surgery unit moved into the space the pain clinic once occupied. The use of opiates, meanwhile, changed medical thinking. Using a patient demanding ever higher, usually a patient demanding ever higher doses of a drug would be proof that the drug wasn't working. But in opiate pain treatment, it was taken as proof that the doctor hadn't yet prescribed enough. <laughs> Indeed, some doctors came to believe that a pain patient demanding higher doses was likely to be exhibiting signs of pseudo-addiction, looking for a dose large enough to kill the pain, the cure for which was more opiates. Checks out. <laughs> Two doctors, writing in 1989 in the journal Pain, coined the term to describe the case of a 17-year-old suffering from leukemia, pneumonia, and chest pain, and asking for opiate painkillers, which physicians had misdiagnosed as addiction. One of the authors, J. David Haddix, later went to work at Purdue Pharma as Vice President for Health Policy. The other, David Wiseman, later described that doctors ought to do in case what doctors ought to do in case of pseudo-addiction, build trust and aggressively increase the doses of opiates until pain was relieved, Wiseman wrote. For all I know, the pseudo-addiction may well be a real syndrome, but its importance to this story lies in that it helped nourish a growing body of thought. Mm that there was conceivably, conceivably no limit to the amount of opiates a patient might need. Doctors might prescribe hundreds of milligrams a day. Certainly, according to the widely accepted misinterpretation of Porter and Jick at least, there was minimal risk. No physician would simply go on with the same unsuccessful treatment, but that is what happens with opioids, said Lozier. Patients come and say, that's great, doc, but I need more. The doctor gives them a higher dose. Then three months later, they say the same thing, and so on. The point is, if it were working, you wouldn't need more. Mm. Nevertheless, a movement was born, radiate, radiating out from a simple one-paragraph statement in 1980. Other documents were used as well. Portnoy and Foley's own 1986 paper about 38 patients, citing Porter and Jick, was among them. So, too, was a 1982 survey of supervisors at 93 burn units that found no patients growing addicted to, to opiate painkillers. In a 1977 study of drug dependency in patients with chronic headaches, but it appears that none was cited, nor misinterpreted as often as Porter and Jick. Dr. Herschel Jick, meanwhile, kept plumbing his ever-expanding patient databases. They could be, he believed, a source of clinically-based information about drugs and their effects, something mankind had never possessed. He produced papers on a wide variety of topics, whether oral polio vaccines caused by caused a collapsing of the bowels in children, whether certain oral contraceptives caused blood clots, in w blood clots in women, and on the origin of a mumps epidemic in England. All the while, in his 1980 letter was sparking of mo his 1980 letter was sparking a movement. It's an amazing thing, he said many years later. That particular letter for me was very near the bottom of a long list of studies that I've done. It's usual as it stands because there's nothing 
it's usual as it stands because there's nothing like it on hospitalized patients but if you read it carefully it does not speak to the level of addiction in outpatients who take these drugs for chronic pain have a good day friends